All right, so open up the Taft folder file here, and let's look through his speech. Um, what was Taft's foreign policy called? Dollar Dollar Diplomacy. Dollar Dollar Diplomacy, right? I like that a lot. Dollar Diplomacy. Easy peasy, right? What's that mean? What it? What What does it mean that he had this idea of Dollar Diplomacy? Okay, yeah, he talks about in this uh, in this speech about replacing bullets with dollars. And who is he alluding to? He's alluding to Roosevelt, right? And what's Roosevelt's policy? Or what was it? Sorry. Yeah, you've got the big stick policy, so what's that mean in the end? If something happens, what should we do? Okay. Yeah, we're gonna use our we're gonna use our military if we need to, right? Uh, so we get in little skirmishes, you know, throughout uh, TR's presidency. Not too many, but we do use force if we need, right? In general, though, he speaks softly. He uses that portion and arbitrates, like we said, with or some of the places that he arbitrated deals. You guys remember? Kind of the big one that we discussed. Was, yeah, with, between Japan and Russia over the, over what? Over Manchuria, so he was basically upholding the open door policy by doing that. Kind of, right? Kind of gave just gave away Manchuria, so not really, but um, prevented war that way. So we didn't have to take sides militarily in that war. That would have been a tough decision for us to make, right? Uh, so Taft comes in and changes this foreign policy now. What do you guys know about Taft, besides the fact that he had his own bathtub in the White House because he was too big or whatever? <laughs> Nothing? Yeah. Okay, he's like three, so plus, 300 plus pounds, that guy. So Taft was, Taft was a big old boy. He loved golf, though. So just so you know, he's a big golfer. That's a, that's a key thing. So, Key thing to understand about Pat is he loved golf. Yeah, not really, but uh, so so he's a big dude. But and that's all anybody ever knows about Pat when they come into high school. Is, hey, we don't know anything about him except for he was the fat guy that had to have the big baptism, right? That's that's like the only thing anybody knows. So if we we're going to sum up PR's political views, what would we? Liberal or conservative? I was TR. And this time, it's more progressive. You're going to talk about, we're going to talk about that more as we actually talk about the domestic policy in the U.S. But what what was his policy? What was his political stance? TR? How so? What does it mean to be a... Okay. Okay, so it may be a more aggressive foreign policy. I, okay, now I see what you're saying. Okay. So maybe more aggressive in regards to foreign policy. Okay, now I get your connection there. Uh, yeah. Now, compared to that time period, let's step back to 1902. Is he liberal or conservative? He was very, very liberal, right? Um, what's that mean? What does it mean to be a conservative? Let's kind of talk about that. If you're a conservative, what do you want? Okay. All right. Yeah. In general, smaller government. Yeah. The strict interpretation or constructionist ideology, which means. Okay, yeah, there are other things. You know, there's more parts to being a conservative than just small government kind of thing. But uh, in this, you know, in 1902, when, when he takes the presidency, like, how is how does he get to be, how does TR, we, didn't, we should have talked about this the other day, but how does TR become president? He was uh, like, how did he actually physically become president? Did he get elected? Since I'm asking that question, what's the obvious answer? 
No. <laughs> okay. No. No. Okay. Remember vaguely who was the president during the Spanish American War, all that good stuff. We got McKinley, okay? So McKinley gets reelected in 1900 and he gets assassinated. Uh, I don't remember for sure. But, yeah. okay, so McKinley gets assassinated and let's look this up because this is worth it you google d roosevelt vice president party see what it brings up here i'm going to show you guys this i think i can find what i'm looking for We're actually kind of stepping back. Okay, so uh, if you type in okay, so if you look at this. Mm -hmm. What is that? What is that political thing? He's a wuss, <laughs> and he actually ran for vice president. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So he went and fought in the war. Um, that's where he gets his fame. Is he a go getter, or is he a just sit back and hang out kind of guy? Just from what we've talked about with his friends. Pretty insecure, right? Yeah. Okay. So, do you think that Roosevelt wanted to be president? Mm -hmm. Okay. Really, he wanted to be president. All right, this is the key thing. This is what this shows you. All right, so ignore. Uh, you don't have to ignore the one ballot only thing here. But get your vice presidential nominee, and how is he there? He's in this wagon, getting drugged by what? What's he getting drugged? You guys notice that? Pulling him around in that wagon. <laughs> no? That's an elephant. Why is it an elephant? All right, so you know it's an elephant, but why is he being pulled around by an elephant? What does that say? The political parties. The Republicans are an element, right? Okay, so you've got the Republican Party pulling Roosevelt in a wagon behind them. And this wagon that says vice presidential nominee, and there by choice. Yeah, he's all tied up, right? And uh, he's got his gun all tied up, and he's just basically being drugged into the vice president. So he wanted.
wanted to be president. Why do you think he was not chosen as the nominee? It's up to the parties to decide. In the end, you know, we have all these primaries and those things, but they basically, in the end, whoever the political parties throw the money behind gets the nomination from each party. So he doesn't get the nomination, and he ends up with the vice presidential nomination. Why do you think they put, according to this cartoon, stuck him to the vice presidential as, as the vice presidential nominee? Thank you. Okay, that's okay. So yeah, maybe a little bit reckless. Uh, compared to the ideology of the Republican Party, how does he how does he fall? He's not gonna he's not falling for it. He's not an old conservative. Progressive. So it's very liberal compared to the ideology of the Republican Party. So keep in mind popularity in your name, I think it's like Donald Trump right now, right? How popular he is. Uh, you, you think about that popularity and what that can do, do with politics, right? So you throw Teddy Roosevelt on the on the ballot with McKinley. What's that going to do? For, and McKinley's up for re-election. Right? So he's got a good chance of winning on his own. So TR gets stuck in there with kind of the name to help him. With. Plus he's from New York. New York's got a lot of electoral votes, so they need those votes. So, this also leads to this discussion. What power has the president? <laughs> He's got the, he has the power to be the president of the Senate. When does that person have, when does he have a vote vote? In the case of a tie. So he can direct the Senate if he wants, but typically is that the case? President or vice president. Yeah, you have the president pro tempore of the Senate, which runs the Senate on a day to day basis. The vice president does. Okay. What's the other reason we have vice president? Yeah, he's a member of the Senate, basically. He's the president of the Senate. So he can show up, but he doesn't do that symbolically. Because what would that be doing? Think about the checks and balances. Yeah. Checks and balances and those things kind of meshes the executive branch with Congress. So it, it doesn't happen. I guess long story short here. So what else? What? Why else do we have a vice president? What's the constitutional reason for having a vice president? President died. That's it. That's it. So what power does the vice president have? The power to become the president in an emergency. That's it. Right. That's it. So. Where do you send a politician to go to have their political career die? Vice presidency. Thanks for all your help. Here's the vice presidency. <laughs> no, you really want to be president. Thanks for help. Thanks for all your help getting our party all this going and all the you know elected maybe, but we really need you to run as vice president now. So. The Republicans stick him there against his will. In general, he didn't want to be vice president uh, because he that, that was his view on it. Was vice, you know, that's the way of killing me in politics. He did not want to be vice president. So he gets strangled up and all that in this cartoon, which shows he's all tied down and all those things. And then the Republican Party's fears come true. Kinley gets assassinated. R takes the presidency and changes foreign policy. Now, keep in mind, we've already fought the Spanish American War, so we're not so much isolationist anymore. Right? We've got that, those ideas are there. But the difference is, we talked about with the Roosevelt Corollary the other day, that Roosevelt throws some teeth behind uh, the Monroe Doctrine. And it also turns us into that world police power. Okay. So. so Remember why did we get involved with this one? He, he didn't want to. No, remember what, what happened? What were the reasons we got involved? The name blew up and what, what else? 
that that one letter, remember that? So the Delon letter, remember that? So that's another reason. So he didn't really want to be involved in that. He <laughs> he fell in line in general with what the public wanted, which was to stay out, stay isolation until we had the reason to get involved. And then post Spanish American War things changed gaining all that territory in the Philippines, uh, those different things. So you've got so you have McKinley, and then you've got Roosevelt who's throwing around this idea that we're going to have this huge military, big Navy, going to get the Panama Canal Bill, all of those things. He gets reelected in 1904. Roosevelt, Roosevelt does. And he, he runs and says, I'm only going, this is my last term. That's what he says when he runs. So he probably, in hindsight, shouldn't have ever made that statement for his political career. Uh, in the end, he'll want to come back. So he steps down in 1908, and he chooses who's going to be the successor for He chooses basically Taft to be. Uh, we're going to go more into their politics and political stances and things. We can talk about domestic policy, but Kat, when you choose somebody to follow you, what do you expect them to do? Follow in your footsteps, right? The problem is, is after Taft gets uh, elected, he goes back. So it makes uh, TR mad. Basically, we'll talk about the election of 1912 uh, once we get into domestic policy. And how he comes he comes back in nineteen twelve. Roosevelt does try and win the presidency, but Taft goes backward. I guess my long, long story short here, Taft goes backward on what Roosevelt did. So, in, so he says in that speech, we're gonna replace bullets with or uh, yeah, bullets with dollars. Instead of being willing to and growing this military, we're going to intervene when we have the chance. Dollars. So I guess what what is Taft's argument? All right. Yeah. So yeah. So instead of let's throw our weight around and send the military in to make things happen the way we want them to. He's saying, let's send money to stabilize the governments that are there, uh, especially the ones that are democratic. So let's send money to stabilize these countries in Latin America and overseas to make sure that revolutions aren't necessary, to, make, to try and make the people not want to revolt. That's the kind of the key ideology there. So instead of making things happen by force, let's indirectly make things happen by trade. Right? And so it's not necessarily just sending money either. It's also promoting trade to these other countries. So he talks about how modern, you know, I underlined in that reading that modern diplomacy is commercial. Um, how does that compare, and that was one of the questions, is how does that compare to TR's views uh, in regards to how to protect American commerce? In order to protect our commercial trade, we've got Taft is throwing this idea of dollar diplomacy out there. So stabilizing these governments, how does that compare to uh, TR's views on Okay, if there's a chance and opening up that stuff and also protecting it with a huge navy, you get back to what we talked about with mainland, right? So he's saying let's open up trade in a friendly way. That's the basic ideology uh, by spending money. All right, and then he talks about China. Maybe what's our policy with China? Yeah, the open door policy, right? Which means what again? That'll be on the test later on. So. Okay. You guys are just going to remain your own people and you're going to remain independent and nobody's going to take you over because we all need you to trade. 
that was the open door policy. Um, somebody could take you. That's the thing. That's why we made that deal. Remember, we didn't want somebody else to take or to take China. So, um, if you go down to page, whatever it is, uh, the third page there, it talks about China. It's kind of towards the end of the reading. Um, but benefit. And he says the United States has had a positive influence in China. The, the use of American capital in the development of China by the promotion of those essential reforms to which China is pledged by treaties with the United States and other powers has had a positive influence. That's basically what he's saying. How has been what he says there? How, how do you guys, what do you guys think about? Why did you think he said that, that American capital uh, has been an integral part in the development of China. What do you mean? What does he mean by that? Okay. And it's stabilizing, right? So he's saying this is an example of dollar, this idea of dollar diplomacy working. If we trade with countries in a friendly way, we're going to stabilize those countries because their economies are going to be strong enough to take care of their people. Does that make sense? So that's what he says we should instead of throwing the force of the American military behind what we want to happen, we should instead stabilize these countries, not use military force to stabilize these countries, and then that way we have to that's his whole plan for the for his foreign policy. And promoting peace. Isn't that what we want in the end? Promoting peace in the name of national security like we talked about. If we to stay at, to protect our own national security worldwide, we don't want to have wars come. So he's saying let's support all these developing countries, our economy with, and how does it help the United States? Yeah, we have a market for all the stuff we're producing in the United States as well. So it's a two-way street. Okay, so Taft then, key thing to remember when you, especially as we get into domestic policies, Taft is ultra conservative, ultra strict constructionist. TR for that time period, super liberal constructionist, pretty liberal, leans liberally. Right. Um, so you've got Taft ticking off Roosevelt the entire time that Taft is in prison, even though Taft was there probably because TR helped him. Something to keep in mind. All right, and then I saw down here. On page four, I, I wrote in my comments there that Taft is making a bold statement against Big Stick, right? Against Roosevelt. It's on that page yet, where it says the useless loss of life, the devastation of property, the bombardment of defenseless cities, the killing and wounding of women and children, the torturing of non combatants, and to exact contributions and the suffering of thousands of human beings might have been averted had the Department of State, through approval of the Loan Convention by the Senate, been permitted to carry out its now well-developed policy of encouraging the extending of financial aid to weak Central American countries. Yeah, it, okay, yeah, we've got these awful things going on. Like, what is the tone of that? Yeah, like, it's such a negative tone. It's you know, you, there's there are other words that you can use for torture and bombardment of defenseless cities. It could have you know, useless loss of life. So exactly. So so that tone right there. If you're Teddy Roosevelt, you're sitting there and you read this in the paper that your boy Taft said this about basically your administration and your policy. What do you think? <laughs> Could be, right? Yeah. So, TR, it's, I mean, think about it. If you were TR, it's in his shoes. Man, you got to do it. Everything opposite of what, I, what I've what i done. What You know, my whole presidency was built on this, making us a strong military power. And then what's Taft doing with it? You know, just sitting there thinking about it that way. I think it's interesting. And this is why Roosevelt comes back in 1912 to try to get reelected. But he did it 
he didn't he lost right. which i would hope you know yeah. because you know you read the next guy's yeah. foreign policy but, so, yeah. but, but uh, in 1912 roosevelt essentially kills the republican party's chance because he runs he doesn't get the nomination um and then Taft runs again, and then they split the vote of the Republican Party. So basically, there's two Republican nominees there, so the Republican Party splits their votes between the conservative wing and the progressive uh, wing. So we'll talk about that more in another video. It's, it's an interesting topic. Um, Bull Moose Party. You guys have heard of the Bull Moose Party? That was the, that was, that was the nickname of TR's party, the Progressive Party. He basically, he and his buddies created the Progressive Party to try and get him really which in turn split the Republican vote and then allowed Wilson to become president. Not politically, no, it wasn't. But basically, I think, you know, politically, Wilson lined up, he was more progressive than that. So Wilson's, especially domestic policy, uh, Wilson was the, uh, elected to be a domestic president. World War One kind of happened, so uh, his obviously he obviously got thrown into things that he wasn't necessarily strong at. He wasn't he wasn't a foreign policy guy. Like when he was elected, he was not there to be a foreign policy guy. Uh, that way, just wasn't his strategy, I guess. But so anyway, so you got that's kind of a segue into what we're going to talk about another day. But you get Wilson. Thing. What's his policy call? You guys did you get? I know it didn't really say it in the reading, but I guess it did in the reading I had to read right at the beginning of class. What's his policy? Make sure there's nothing. Okay, yes, missionary diplomacy. Let's actually pull up that um, brief quote there that I pulled from a website briefly this morning because I noticed that I didn't actually give you what his policy was. And this quote, I think, sums up so it sums up missionary diplomacy. So read through it one more time here. I would like you to tell me what is policy, what it, what it means to have missionary diplomacy. And he doesn't call it missionary diplomacy. Just keep that in mind. Missionary diplomacy. Okay, yeah. All right. Okay, so. Okay, and, and we're not enemies with Latin America, right? In this statement specifically, he's talking about Latin America. So, yeah, we should be buddies with, with you in Latin America. And we should have, in the end, let's just talk about that last part of it real quick, and then we'll come back. It says we should have genuine disinterested friendship. What does it mean to be disinterested? Yeah, yeah, we don't. We're yeah. Hey, we're we're neighbors. It's like those neighbors you have that they're kind of weird, but you're like, hey, I'm I'm just gonna stay out of their business. You know, like I'm yeah. I'm not gonna. I'm not going out of my way to talk to you. <laughs> I don't really, I think you're a little bit weird, so hi when I drive by. But other than that, I'm not going to go out of my way to talk to you. That's, what it, that's kind of what it means by disinterested friendship. Like, we're going to get along, but we're not going to hang out. And I'm not gonna go, we're not going to go out of our way to have uh, a relationship with you. Does that make sense? So he's really, really close. Um, kind of, yeah. Talk about this more as we get into this rest of this quote, though. He says, um, we should have understanding and cooperation, right? So, friendly understanding and cooperation. Let's be buddies. Let's just kind of hang out. You know, out. We're on the same hemisphere, so we're neighbors, so we should really get along. Let's not have any disputes over the things that I'm about to build. Or so, um, and he says, as friends, we shall prefer those who act in the interest of peace and honor. So, what is he saying there? Okay. 
Yeah. All right. So basically, yeah, he's saying we're going to act in the interest of peace and honor. We're we and we are going to be. We're not going to be involved unless we have the some problems in your country. All right. Kind of said that wrong because his whole idea is to not get involved in any wars. I, I talked about how he's not a foreign policy guy. So he says, we're going to be friends with those countries and those governments that are peaceful and that, and it goes on to say, protect private rights and respect the restraints of constitutional provision. So those countries, what does it mean to protect? The governments that protect private rights, what does that mean? Okay, taking care of your people and basically allowing them to trade and be best for them, you know, do what's best for themselves. Um, and then respect the restraints of constitutional provision. Okay, so yeah, respect the limits of the government. Now, if you're going to, and this kind of alludes to the fact, what does it mean to be uh, constitutionally a part of the? How do you be, how do you come into power in the United States if you want to become a person in? Congress or the presidency, what do you do? Okay. But in order for me to become president, what do I have to do? Just like long story short, get elected, right? And I have to do that under the provisions of the Constitution. So if What's, what he's saying, then, is if you have some group in the government that wants to become part of the government, what should you do? Not just in our country, but if you're in Latin America, what should, how should you come into power? Constitutionally. Okay, so don't be ruffling the feathers of the governments that are already here. Does that make sense? Okay, now what's not in here is the kind of the main part and his... How he uh, promotes the peace in these countries. And what he says is if you have a country and a government that is not there to promote peace and honor and protect the rights of its people, we're just not going to do business with you. Isn't that what it all comes to? Do you think that Latin America needs it? Economically, they do, right? So we talked about recognition the other day. Remember how we, you know, presidential recognition. So what Roosevelt does is if a government revolts and takes over unconstitutionally or is not protecting the private rights or is not there in the interest of peace and honor, is he says, okay, we're not going to recognize you. Wilson. Wilson, yeah. Sorry. So Wilson says, we're not. I'm not going to recognize you. Period. What's it mean if the government does if the United States government does not recognize a country? What does that mean? Trade. So do what we want or you're gonna lose our business. Um I would say we would probably if we were forced to step in, probably would have because we wouldn't want the imperial idea, but depends on which government. If it, I'm sure we would get involved in some way, but keep in mind those countries aren't necessarily wanting to expand the Western Hemisphere because they're going to mess with us. Um, they need to trade with us. So, if, so say Great Britain tries to start a revolution, or let's say Germany tries to start a revolution in Mexico, or gets say maybe tries to get Mexico to attack the United States. <laughs> you know, uh, what are we going to do? We're going to cut off trade, basically. So we'll not recognize that government. So that hurts them. That's his policy. Okay? We've got six minutes to come to this now. now he talks, in that document I had you guys read, it's a repudiation of the uh, dollar diplomacy. So 
what's that? I mean, what does that mean? What does that mean to, be, to repudiate something? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really completely tell me so. Um, so, which of these guys, I, my question here is, what is the long-term result of these three presidents on the, on the United States foreign policy? Which one of these? Sorry, I cut you off. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, that's right. That's the first time we really start getting involved. One more specific question here is: Which of these three? Which of these three do you guys think has had the most significant impact on foreign policy in the of America? Still now. This is the question. All these guys are interventions, aren't they? Just in different ways. This is military. So, okay, so we use military intervention. No. Any type of intervention? No. Okay, so let's just go through each of these guys. Wilson, how do we use Wilson's mission? Done that with Cuba for four years. Right. Um, another part of this, you know, and, and it's missionary diplomacy is going to change over time. We talked about World War One. You know, we and we had, you know, we talked about the idea of American exceptionalism. What else? What what is going to be the second part of this? After these countries are stabilized, what what should we do? Help them how? What are we going to create? Yeah, we're going to have them help this to the idea. Help them create a democracy, a free country. So that, that's also something that becomes part of Wilson's foreign policy as we get into World War. At first, the whole point of this is to stay out of wars, right? That's the point. And then we end up getting in, but I mean, not even until the end of World War One. So we say, and it is pretty successful in staying out of wars uh, until we have no choice. Uh, so we've got Wilson with that missionary diplomacy. We go in and we try to nation build after there's a war. Right? Try to promote democracy and promote the American idea all over the world uh, because they did trade with. And then you have dollar as well. Yeah. How is that used to be guns and stuff? All right. <laughs> Uh, all right, yeah. Uh, one example of this uh, that we'll talk about is the Marine Point. It's really the only time it's ever really worked. Where you just throw in like millions and millions and millions of dollars or something, and it works. Like, so the whole point of throwing millions of dollars at Europe is to stabilize all those governments. So that we, yeah, well, so that they don't fall to, at that point, the purpose was to keep them from falling to communism. Uh, but it did stabilize, and it did work. Uh, communism did work end up spreading so much, you know, after the Marshall Plan, after the after in Europe, they end up spreading. So it's, it's one of the 
few circumstances where, hey, let's just throw millions of dollars at something. In that. But we do use that, right? We send we send aid to countries that are having problems, that are, you know, think uh, Haiti is an earthquake. Right? That could be because what's the, what does that earthquake do? To Haiti? I mean, yeah, and it, you know, not that their economy was that strong before, but if, exactly, yeah. If things get so bad, people decide, hey, let's uh, let's this government's not working, let's overthrow it. You know, so we we help, and that's the part of the dollar diplomacy. I think. So think about that in terms of you know for the essay, I would outline that as one of you know one of your options. Think about how this changed the scope of foreign policy. Which of these do we use most? And I mean, could you argue in the favor of either one of those three? Yeah, so that's my point here is you it's everything's a combination of these three guys. And this is why these guys are so I mean I, I just want to say word shattering, but they change the policy and this is why we kind of study these three together. These guys are these three are known as the progressive presidents. Because of their foreign policies and also because of their domestic policies, which we're gonna look at next. Anything else? Uh, if you look at those maps, you can see all pretty much uh, our interventions. We've got two maps there. One of them is from 78 to 92, so more recent. It shows you all the interventions we had in Latin America there. And then the other one is kind of the progressive era, all the interventions in Latin America as well. So you can use those things as evidence you know, for, let's say, this. Okay, let's look into those things. Okay.